Good afternoon gentlemen and welcome back. I decided I'm going to shoot a short video series on a sodium formate reduction of silver from a nitrate solution. And what I have in front of us here are a few items that we're going to be using in our experiment. Now this will be a first for me also. I've refined silver in the past, but I usually use the cementation process along with the silver cell. So I decided to go ahead and try to shoot this experiment both for my educational purposes as well as yours. Now usually I'm a gold refiner and anybody that knows me knows that I despise silver. But like any good field that you're going to study of science, you have to be able to understand other aspects of that same field. And by understanding those aspects of that field, it will help better educate you in the field that you think you already know so much about. Now, like I said, I like gold. For me, it takes less gold than it does silver to make a profit. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you a few items that we're going to be using in our experiment and I'm kind of going to run through each item and what it does and how that we're going to use it. Now the first item I have over here is I have a five pound sack of sodium formate and it's in dry powder form. Behind that, I have a couple gallons of distilled water. You can pick these up at Walmart, CVS, anywhere like that for about 80 cents to a dollar a gallon. Always use distilled water. If you use tap water or put any chlorides into this experiment, we're kind of going to complicate things a little bit, not to mention lose some of our silver. Now the third thing I have back here is sodium hydroxide. Now the sodium hydroxide is what we're going to add to precipitate some of the metals from the solution before we use our formate to precipitate our silver from solution. And I'll go into the theory behind that in just a moment. Uh, to our left we have our pH probe and this is a combination pH temperature probe combination and it also has automatic temperature compensation built in for the pH. Uh, I paid $55 shipping and handling and all. Uh, I've used Milwaukee instruments in the past and I've always had good luck out of them. They make a good quality product. Uh, this one here came with our temperature, pH meter, and probe. It also comes with the solutions that we're going to need to calibrate our probe with. And this has a removable probe head on it. So if this probe head ever goes bad, you could change this, this probe head out. This ain't, you can find cheap pH pro meters on eBay for $10 or $15, but you're going to get what you pay for. Uh, we need to do some pretty precise pH measurements and temperature measurements in order for this experiment to work properly and to know that we followed the proper parameters. Should something go wrong, we need to count on our instrumentation. Uh, this particular instrument here, if you'll notice, it has seals. This is a big rubber seal right here. It has another rubber seal on the bottom. And up here in the top where the battery goes, it has another rubber seal. The screen is sealed. Uh, this is made of a chemical resistant polymer plastic. Uh, you could actually take this thing and set it in nitric acid and let it float around like a fish bobber and pull it out and this thing would still work. Now, I haven't calibrated this pH probe yet. We're going to have to calibrate it. Uh, the first thing you need to do when it comes out of the package is you need to soak this probe tip right here 
in some water and you could use just regular chlorinated water will be fine and another point to mention once this probe is put into active use it should always stay in a liquid you cannot take this out and let this thing dry out it screws with them real bad uh, the factory recommends that you store this in just regular tap water they say not to use deionized water and not to use distilled water. I thought that was kind of funny, but we need to soak the probe for about two hours before we calibrate the probe. And then anytime this probe head is not in use, it needs to be in a tap water solution. So basically, once you start using this thing, you'll always want to keep that probe tip wet. So, I'll soak this in some water for a couple of hours and then I'll calibrate this before we start with our experiment. Now, back here in the back, I have two one liter bottles of formic acid. And I ordered these from Dutta Diesel online. I also ordered the sodium hydroxide from him. He's pretty reasonable on his price, his shipping, plus he's not very far north of me in North Alabama from where I'm located, so I get it pretty much the next day. The difference between the formic acid and the sodium formate is that this has sodium in it in dry powder form, but this is basically formic acid with sodium attached to it and we're going to use this for our selective precipitation of our silver from our nitrate solution and this is supposed to be a selective reducing agent now we're going to once we dissolve this into the water we're going to have a, a pH difference that is what this formic acid is for. This is 95% formic acid. We're going to use the formic acid to adjust the pH of the sodium formate before we add it to our silver nitrate solution to precipitate our silver. And this sodium formate can also reduce silver it could reduce platinum, it could reduce palladium, and it could reduce gold. It's a selective reducing agent for those precious metals. Now, earlier I mentioned the sodium hydroxide. Well, the way all this plays into the system is we're going to use sodium hydroxide to adjust the pH of the silver nitrate solution. By doing that, we're going to precipitate some of the metals from the solution before we use our sodium formate to selectively reduce our silver. And what I mean by that is some of our metals are going to precipitate out of solution as oxides, hydroxides, they can precipitate a lot, a lot of different ways when we add our sodium hydroxide. So by precipitating some of our metals out will have a cleaner solution to selectively precipitate our silver from. And what happens a lot of times, uh, there's a process that occurs whenever crystals form from a solution and that is called nucleation. And during the process of nucleation, the first thing you have formed is one atom of something. More atoms attach to that atom and create a complex crystal which is known as a precipitate. Well, whenever we precipitate these crystals from solution, they'll come down according to the literature that I've read on this is a coarse fine sand granule which is easy to wash. But what we don't want to happen is we try to precipitate it from a real dirty solution and when we try to do that we wind up with some drag down that comes down with our silver now the literature that I've read on the formate reduction method claims a 4-9 purity now 
If that's so, this would be great because a lot of times I do a lot of sterling silver refining when I am refining silver. And you have a lot of copper contaminants in sterling silver. And if there's a way that we could precipitate that silver without having to go through the cementation process, then you have to clean that silver, then you have to melt that silver, introduce that into a silver cell, run it through a silver cell, harvest those crystals, wash those crystals, melt those crystals into a bar form. Well, if this formate reduction system will work, what it does is it makes it possible for you to produce a high quality silver from a very trashy solution by skipping several steps. Now you can also produce a high quality silver with other methods. You can use the chloride method where you convert silver into chlorides and then convert the chlorides back to a metallic silver leaving most of the impurities in the steps that proceed. So in this one we're going to try to prove that we can drop silver from a trashy solution and come out with a one step process besides the cleaning steps of a 3-9 fine silver or a 4-9 high quality purity silver product. Now the other thing that I need to explain is what I'm using as a feedstock for this. Well. What I have here in the pyroceram dish, and if you've seen my previous videos, you know what pyroceramic materials are. This is some silver that I recovered from the very, very last steps of cleaning up a silver cell. And whenever you do that, I cemented this with copper, and when you cement it with copper from a very dilute solution over a long period of time, you wind up with a lot of copper trapped in your silver. And I also use air agitation to bubble through my solutions so that I keep those dilute solutions really agitated so they come in contact with the copper surface. But what you wind up doing is creating a lot of copper contaminants that will uh, contaminate the residue that comes from uh, the recovery in that cement process. And that's exactly what we have here in front of us. Now, because I don't have any sterling silver to use for this experiment, this is what I'm going to use. And sterling silver comes in at about 92.5%, 8% copper. Uh, I'm going to call this a little bit dirtier than that. I would say that this may, uh, this may be 80-20. This may be 80% silver, 20% copper, which is even better because I want to test some of these claims that uh, this process will work even from a dirty solution. Now, Eastman Kodak done several patents on this process back in the uh, mid to early 80s. And Eastman Kodak, before we moved into the digital age, was the biggest photographer uh, chemicals processor in the world. And they used tons and tons of silver in the photographic process and the manufacturing of uh, the uh, different applications for photos, for x-ray film, they was involved in anything that had to do with silver and photography. So they had a patent on this process and I'm not sure that, if, that it's been perfected. Uh, I have several friends that are chemists that swear this process works and uh, one of them, it's actually his recipe that I'm going to be following for this formate reduction and if I trust anybody in the world, uh, I trust four metals. So we're going to cut away now here in just a moment. I think I've pretty well explained to you what we're using for everything in this process here. And uh, we're going to uh, go ahead and get 
our labware set up and get ready to start processing this material and experimenting. Uh, it's going to take me a few hours to set up my temperature and pH probe. I've come over here and uh, I've put down new cardboard here recently inside of my fume hood and everything to catch splashes and spills. And here I have my GE hot plates and I like to give little tips and tricks and one of those is is these are not exposed elements these are enclosed elements and these are GE hot plates and they do not make this particular model anymore uh, I think they may have had an issue with a fire from one or two next thing you know you got a class action lawsuit and it's just cheaper to quit making the damn things than it is to pay the attorney fees and all but I swear by these, uh, I seek these out at trade days, swap shop, yard sales, uh, these things are workhorses. I, I just don't know any other which way I could put it. You're looking at this one, this one's every bit two years old, and this one's four or five years old and the life expectancy of hot plates if you're doing chemical reactions on top of these surfaces are very short trust me I've been through all types of makes and models to find out what works and you just can't kill these things but uh, in the prime of their life you can get this double burner for $40 uh, you can get this single burner for about $25 and I would recommend if you can find one of these to latch on to it. Uh, they're real sensitive temperature controls. They're real easy to control. I just can't brag enough about this product. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and cut away now. And we're going to go ahead and get our laboratory set up and everything. And I'm going to show you how to go ahead and start processing this silver. And we're going to try to do this using a formate reduction.